we're going to move a little bit away from from the knee and obviously quite quite dangerous conditions for the career of an athlete we're going to move to a topic which is life-threatening for the athlete we're going to move to the cardiac side and I'm, I'm very happy to present one of our Aspatar cardiologists, Dr. Carmen. As you can see from her name, she's from Spain. I invite you again to look in the booklet for her biography. Okay. And she's going to yeah, do the yeah. first part of our cardiology talk to educate a little bit about the prevalence of, of cardiac problems in athletes, the screening that we can do. And the second part is going to be done by Victoria, who is also a cardiologist, who is from the UK. So Carmen, please, the floor is yours. This one forward, this one back forward, and the lasers here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ola, for your presentation. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Um, I'm pleased to be invited as speaker in this conference. Um, in the name of my colleague, Dr. Watt, and in my own name, I want to thank you, the organizing committee, for, the, for this opportunity and for including on a specific sport cardiology issue in this conference about new concept, concepts in Hamburg. The sudden death of a young Hamburg player is always a devastating episode. It's not only devastating for family, for friends, it's also devastating for us. We work with athletes and we care about them. But beyond the emotional impact of these episodes, why does sudden cardiac death in Humboldt matter for us? Does this matter because the figures? Which is the incidence of sudden cardiac death in Humboldt? Or what is probably more relevant, how many Humboldt players may be at risk of sudden cardiac death? Is this a preventable fatality? If so, how we can prevent sudden cardiac death in Humboldt? These three questions will be addressed in this presentation. We don't know exactly which is the incidence of sudden cardiac death in Humboldt. There is no specific register about this issue. We do know that the overall incidence of sudden cardiac death among young athletes range from one to four out of 100,000 per year. We know also that there are some sports at higher risk. Even one out of 11,000 players died of sudden cardiac death in basketball. We know that male and black athletes are also at higher risk. So with these figures, let's go to estimate which could be the incidence of sudden cardiac death in Humboldt, the impact of this incidence. In July 2009, the International Humboldt Federation listed 166 member federations. Around 90 million players around the world play in Humboldt. The incidence of sudden cardiac death in Humboldt is similar to the overall incidence in other sports. Let's say three out of 100,000 players. Every year, around 600 players may die of sudden cardiac death. But if Humboldt is one of these sports with higher incidence, around 1,700 players may be affected of sudden cardiac death. In this last five years period, between 3,000 and 9,000 players, Humboldt players may have died of sudden cardiac death. And if we give consideration to the youth of this population, the number of Live year loss can be as high as 30 to 90,000. These data are really relevant. But probably even more relevant are the figures of athletes that may be at risk of sudden cardiac death. Non traumatic sudden cardiac death occurs always in players with an underlying cardiac condition. The sport participation is not, per se, the reason for an increase of mortality in this population. It's only a trigger for a cardiac arrest in those players with an unknown cardiac condition that may predispose them to a life-threatening arrhythmia. Which are the most 
commonly cardiac condition associated with sudden cardiac death in, in handball, in general in a sport. The most important are genetic disorders, inherited cardiac condition. In other words, familiar cardiac condition. And this is quite relevant for the recognition of players at risk of sudden cardiac death. The family history of a uh, young relative death suddenly before 50 years, a family history of one of these familiar disorders in a first degree relative, may be the marker to detect those players at risk of sudden cardiac death. These are the most commonly familiar disorders associated with sudden death. Cardiomyopathies. There are structural abnormalities affecting the myocardium, the muscle of the heart. Marfan disease is also a structural abnormality. In this case, the structural um, abnormality is in the aorta, it's not in the myocardium. Cardiomyopathies and Marfan disease can be diagnosed with imaging techniques. In this group of structural abnormalities, the most important are cardiomyopathies. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy are, in most of the series, the most important causes of sudden death in young athletes. And we can, we can pick this disease not only with imaging techniques, because when the structure of the myocardium is abnormal, there are also mechanical changes and electrical changes in the heart. And these electrical changes can be detected with an electrocardiogram. A second group of familiar disorders are ion channel diseases. These are abnormalities, molecular and electrical abnormalities. There is no changes in the structure of the heart, but we can pick this disease up with an electrocardiogram. And this is very important for the diagnosis. You can imagine when athlete died and the post-mortem evaluation is, is a white autopsy. There is no abnormal structural heart disease in the heart of these players. These ion channel diseases are the cause of sudden death in these cases, up to 23% of the cases of sudden cardiac death in, in, in athletes are due to these uh, abnormalities. There are a number of non-familiar disorders also associated with sudden cardiac death. The more relevant in this group are the anomalous coronary artery implantation. This is a congenital abnormality, but it's not a familiar disorder. This is tricky. It's not easy to pick the, this abnormality up if the player is asymptomatic. But also players with a normal heart can, can have a blunt chest trauma, a commotio cordis. And as a result of this, they can die of a ventricular arrhythmia. An acute inflammation of the myocardium, a myocarditis, in players with a normal heart previously, can have a ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. And it's also very important, premature coronary artery disease as a, as a cause of sudden death in young athletes. Familiar or non-familiar disorders, Athletes with this condition can perform at elite level and they can be asymptomatic. Between 20 and 50% of the players with this condition can present some symptoms, warning symptoms. And this is very important. Syncope, specifically syncope during exercise, chest pain during the training, fatigue, Shortness of breath at the peak of exercise, dizziness, sometimes are very unspecific, but all players with these symptoms should be referred for cardiovascular investigation. They may have one of these conditions that may predispose them to a sudden cardiac death. But as you see, this happened between 20 and 50% of the cases. Most of the players may are absolutely asymptomatic. Only a ventricular arrhythmia, and this can be the, the, the first manifestation of this disease, a cardiac arrest, 
that in 75% of the cases happen during the exercise, on the court, on the field of play. And if this happens, only prompt recognition and appropriate management can make a real difference in the survival of these humble players. My colleague, Dr. Watt, will address on, his on her presentation about how to manage a player with cardiac arrest on the field. Well, this could be the first symptom. We need to know what to do if this happens. But before this happens, how can we detect those players that can have an underlying cardiac condition if they are absolutely asymptomatic? It has been demonstrated that screening pre-participation is efficient to recognize those players at risk of sudden cardiac death. I want to present you, I want to show you this, uh, this slide, this graphic. This is very interesting. This is the Italian experience um, managing athlete with uh, the implementation of a screening during 25 years period. In the top line, you have the overall incidence of sudden cardiac death in young competitive athletes during this 25 years period. At the beginning of the period, the incidence of sudden cardiac death was 4.2 out of 100,000 players per year. After the implementation of a screening program in which the players were assessed uh, with, um, with family history, personal history, physical examination, and one simple test, one electrocardiogram. After this uh, model of a screening, and with the implementation during 25 years, this was what happened. 90% reduction in the incidence of sudden cardiac death. Less than 0.4 athletes were dying of sudden cardiac death after 25 years period. The role of the screening pre-participation on the reduction of sudden cardiac death is unquestionable. Following this model, in Aspetar, we have performed screening in close to 10,000 players of many different disciplines. I want to present to you the unpublished data about the cardiovascular screening of Hamel players in, in our department. Just to remember you, Hamel players were assessed. It's not working. Humble players were assessed with a family, personal history, family and personal history through a questionnaire, a comprehensive physical examination, and one electrocardiogram. Um, it is important to, to note that the electrocardiogram was always interpreted by one sport cardiologist trained in recognition of abnormalities in the electrocardiogram that are related with the training. As you know, the athlete heart makes some, uh, some changes in the structure and in the electrical manifestation of this athlete heart that can sometimes be challenged to discriminate normal electrocardiogram in athlete from abnormal electrocardiogram in athlete. If the result of the, all this investigation were negative, the players were um, clear for competition. In those players with one abnormal uh, finding, one positive finding, uh, we perform secondary investigation, whatever they need, echocardiogram, stress test, halter, whatever. After the result of this investigation, we could confirm a cardiac condition, and then the player was managed uh, according with the current guidelines, or we just consider that everything was normal and the, play, and the player were, was yeah, uh, just clear for competition. During four years period, from January 2011 until December 2014, we did a screening in 476 players. Most of them were male, and the range of ethnicity included was very high, and most of the players were Arabic. And these are the most important results uh, of, uh, of this screening. Up to 20% of the players 
give a positive result on the history. 6% had a positive family history of sudden cardiac death or one first relative affected on, um, of one of these familiar disorders related with sudden cardiac death. In 16% of the cases, the player was symptomatic or had a personal uh, history related with a possible cardiac condition. As you can see here, 30, 70, uh, sorry, 35 percent of the players had a very unspecific symptom, such as dizziness. But up to six percent of them had a syncope during exercise, which is really one of the most important warning symptoms. Six percent of the players, sorry, six percent of the players had abnormal physical examination and the electrocardiogram was abnormal in 4.6% of the players. These abnormalities were related with a possible underlying cardiac condition and non-training related abnormalities. After undergoing all the, sorry, after uh, perform uh, further investigation in all these players, these are the final result, the final finding in this population. We found, wow. We found five, five cases of bicuspid aortic valve. In one player, this condition was associated with a moderate aortic regurgitation. In another player, this was associated with a severe dilation of the ascending aorta. We pick up one player with acute myocarditis. One player with an abnormal electrocardiogram, an abnormal finding in the, electro, in the echocardiography. Well, we couldn't finish the investigation in this player because he left the country without underwent uh, all the investigation. But this was for sure um, a structural abnormality in the heart. We pick up three hypertensive athletes and one of them with a secondary cause of hypertension. In, if we look at the outcome of these players, we have one player that is currently under follow-up, is playing, is competing under follow-up. This player was disqualified, was considered non-eligible for competition because the risk of bodily collision and the, uh, the dissection of the ascending aorta the player with myocarditis was only temporarily disqualified in six months and he returned to play without any, without any problem. We miss this player, we don't know what happened to him. These three players are now under follow-up and under treatment for the hyperaldosteronism in, in the secondary hypertension. So the prevalence of cardiovascular condition associated with sudden cardiac death in our population if we forget about that player that we couldn't finish the investigation, it's 100 out of 238 players. Sorry, one player out of 238. In total, we can consider that four out of 1,000 players may have a cardiac condition associated with sudden cardiac death. 0.4%. How many humble players currently playing in the International Humboldt Federation may have a cardiovascular condition associated with sudden cardiac death. If this is the prevalence in the whole population, maybe 76%, sorry, 76,000 Humboldt players can be affected of a, um, sudden, of a cardiovascular condition related with sudden cardiac death. 76,000 players may be at risk of sudden cardiac death. In summary, the overall incidence of sudden cardiac death in a sport range 1 to 4 out of 100,000. We don't know which is the incidence in Humboldt, and this could be very important to decide which could be the better strategy for prevention. An international register of sudden cardiac death in Humboldt will help to address this question. Currently, in all population, Four out of 1,000 players may have a cardiac condition associated with sudden cardiac death, may be at risk of sudden cardiac death. 
Pre-participation screening is useful to detect those players at risk. And we consider that a screening recommendation should be provided by the governing body of the Humboldt family, the International Humboldt Federation, and should be internationally implemented to prevent sudden cardiac death in Humboldt. But we do know that even with the best screening program, there will always a case of a player that have a commotio cordis while playing, or an acute myocarditis that can, suffer, can have a cardiac arrest in the field of play. If this happens, only prompt recognition and appropriate management can make a difference in the survival of these players. I hand over this presentation to my colleague, Dr. Victoria Watt. She will address um, all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Carmen. Um, when I was asked to give this, oh, you want to thank you. When I was asked to um, give a talk about sudden cardiac arrest, the brief was to make this relevant to handball. And initially I wondered, how could I possibly do this? As a cardiologist, when we think about sudden cardiac death in athletes, the thought that comes to mind is always prominent football players that die in a very public manner on the pitch. And I thought, how can I possibly make this relevant to the specifically handball? But handball is actually one of the most popular sports in the world. And sudden cardiac death does not discriminate between different sporting activities. And sadly, over the last five years, there have been two young European handball players who have died in the field of play. This is Sebastian Feist, who was a 20-year-old German handball player, captain of the under-21 German team. And he sadly collapsed whilst playing handball. And this was um, reported, obviously, at the time in the national press. But he wasn't the only player who suffered a cardiac arrest. Two years later, Lars Olsen, 23-year-old handball player, and he was from Denmark. He also collapsed whilst playing handball. And sadly, he didn't survive. Dr. Carmen's already spoken to you about how to try and prevent sudden cardiac death with screening. And here in Qatar at Aspatar, we have one of the biggest screening programs in the world. Here we do history, physical examination, and ECG in all our players. So all the handball players who are part participating in Qatar have all been screened. Even handball players that come to play here just for two weeks on a short-term contract or a month or so, they all have the screening that's consistent with the current recommendations from the IOC, the ESC, and also FIFA. So what's happening in the world of handball? There's been one paper published looking at screening in handball players in Europe. And this was published in 2011. And the authors sent out questionnaires to all of the 16 teams that were participating in the European Handball Championship in 2010 in Austria. All the teams were sent a standardized questionnaire. Six, this is 16 teams in total, and eight teams returned the questionnaire covering 122 players. And actually, the handball world, most of the athletes are undergoing some form of appropriate screening. We found that more than 80% of athletes had undergone IOC recommended screening within the last two years. And of these 122 players, only 13% hadn't undergone any form of screening. So I think the handball world are looking at this and recognizing the importance of screening in pre-participation. 
And when we screen, we take the personal history, the family history, and we're interested specifically in symptoms. Dr. Carmen's uh, mentioned syncope already. We also worry about epilepsy, unexplained drowning in the family or road traffic accidents, any, any unexplained death. Why would, it, why would a young person be driving along, no other car is involved, and they're found dead at the side of the road? What's happened there? Sometimes in this country, it can be difficult to get a really accurate family history. There can be many siblings in the family, massive age differences, geographical variations, people are coming from other countries, and sometimes they don't know the exact circumstances of why a sibling may have died. But the family history is really important. And this is why we look at symptoms. This is a case of an 18-year-old handball player who collapsed whilst playing handball. He was lucky, he survived, he had bystander CPR, but he gave an interview afterwards and he mentioned that prior to this episode he was symptomatic. He did have dizziness and sometimes blackouts, and these are all warning signs. As well as the history and the physical examination, we look at the ECG and it's important to remember that in some of these conditions, specifically the iron channel, channelopathies that Dr. Carmen's already mentioned to you, the ECG can often be normal. Just because somebody has an iron channelopathy doesn't mean that their ECG is abnormal 100% of the time. So even doing the ECG is not a guarantee that if the ECG is normal, there is no serious underlying cardiac condition. This is an example of type 1 Brigada syndrome. And here you can see the typical coving ST elevation pattern in lead V1 and V2. But sometimes this individual may have a normal ECG, and sometimes these changes can only be brought on by pharmacological provocation. This is an example of long QT syndrome, another potentially lethal ion channelopathy, where you can see the onset of the Q wave here, and the interval to the end of the T wave is prolonged. And this individual is at risk of ventricular arrhythmias, often associated with exercise. And structural cardiomyopathies also can cause very marked ECG, ECG changes. So here we have an ECG from a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see here very gr gross LVH and ST and T wave abnormalities. So the T waves are inverted inferiorly and laterally. And this is clearly a very, very abnormal ECG. And any player that has an ECG that looks like this, for sure they are not going to be allowed to participate in any form of sport until they've undergone further investigation. But unfortunately, we know that screening is not perfect. There are cases of football players, other athletes who've undergone screening on an annual basis and had normal results, but still sadly go on to suffer a cardiac arrest. We cannot always prevent this. Sometimes the cardiac conditions are hidden and we cannot see them on routing testing. So to move on to some more practical aspects of sudden cardiac arrest and how to, how to manage this if it, if it happens, the first important thing as physicians, as physiotherapists, how do you recognize when somebody's had a cardiac arrest? Okay, you may think it's absolutely obvious. The player goes down, they collapse, they are unresponsive. No argument. But what about if the athlete's still breathing or their eyes are open? If the athlete goes down, they're still breathing, their eyes are open, how can this be consistent with a cardiac arrest? I'd just like to play you a short video here. I'm sure you all know the case. This is Mark Vivian Foe, football player, who sadly had a cardiac arrest in 2003. And you can see when he goes down, his chest wall is clearly moving. He's breathing very quickly. To me, you know, I've seen many patients have cardiac arrests in hospitals. They certainly don't look as though they're breathing. But in athletes, it's different. It's not the same. And really, nobody's quite sure what's going on here, you know. It, nobody's really thinking that this could be a cardiac arrest. Nobody's running on the pitch with defibrillators. He just goes down suddenly, his eyes are open, and he's breathing. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. And if you watch the video play on, you won't show all of it here, but really nobody, nobody really understands. It's very confusing. Everybody's very alarmed, very frightened. Clearly there's a serious problem, but nobody's actually thinking that this could be a cardiac arrest. 
Here we've got discussions going on at the side of the pitch about substitutions. The gravity of the situation hasn't really hit home, you know, and it's, it's, it can be confusing, it can be frightening. It's easy to make a mistake, you know. Here you can see, wake up, wake up. What's happened? Has he had a syncope, you know? Is it, is it a heat problem? Does he need a drink? What's going on? Nobody's thinking this could be a cardiac arrest. Thank you. Please stop the video now. Thank you. So if a player goes down, don't be confused. If they're still breathing, this is agonal breathing. This is consistent with a cardiac arrest. But what about if the player's still moving, if, they're, if they look as though they're fitting, or if they go down and then they get up again, and they speak to somebody and then they go down again? How can, how can this be consistent with a cardiac arrest? Please play the video. So this is a video that was um, taken in the early 90s. And this is Hank Gathers, a basketball player in the United States. So if you just watch him now, there's no contact. Suddenly he goes down. And you can see clearly his limbs are moving. To me, as a medic, he looks as though he's having a fit. I wouldn't think, and then he gets up. And when he gets up, he actually says to his, to his teammates, to his coach, I want to go on. He's speaking. How can this possibly be a cardiac arrest? And then when he goes down again, you will see his legs. To me, this, this just looks like a seizure. Does the guy have epilepsy? You know, you, you're wondering what's going on here? What's going on? It, it doesn't look like a cardiac arrest, but this is an athlete and sometimes Athletes present differently in cardiac arrest than you would imagine somebody in their 60s or 70s, for example, where they tend to just go down and they're out and that's it. And really you can see there's no AED being brought on. People aren't, really aren't sure what's going on. You know, this is almost two minutes after he's collapsed. He's been taken off the field of play. Almost two minutes now. <coughs> no resuscitation. Nobody's really recognizing that this could be a cardiac problem. And if you look at studies of young, young players, for example, this is a study of um, some young American college athletes in, published in 2009, and they looked at 14 cases of young athletes that went down with a cardiac arrest. And half of these individuals actually presented with seizure symptoms at the point of collapse. And you wonder why this is. Well, it's because they have an arrhythmogenic disorder. And what happens is they have an arrhythmia. The arrhythmia causes cerebral hypoxia, and the athlete has a fit. Sometimes these arrhythmias can self-terminate. So then the athlete appears to come round again, and then the arrhythmia comes back again, and they collapse again. So if a player goes down, and they're still breathing, or they're still moving, or even they seem to come round. You have to treat this as a cardiac arrest until proved otherwise. So how do you treat it? It's very straightforward, as you all know. As physiotherapists and, sur and surgeons and medics, when you are at the pitch side, you will be expected to be a first responder, and you will be involved in the chain of survival, delivering CPR and then using the AED. And we know certainly in the football field that Team physicians and physiotherapists are very well trained in CPR and also AED use. And the first thing to do is deliver good quality chest compressions. You don't need to worry about breathing. You just need to give very good chest compressions. The American Heart Association now recommend hands-only CPR, and this can be given straight away. And all, following this, obviously, you need the AED. And for this, you must have an emergency action plan you must have trained responders that can deliver both CPR and use the AED. You need access to early defibrillation, so the equipment must be available at the court side, ready to use should the worst happen. And you should have an annual practice and review of your procedures so that everybody is fully prepared and everybody knows what, what their role is should something occur. Because we know that early defibrillation is the key to survival in cardiac arrest. 
and the sooner that a life-saving shock can be delivered, the ventricular arrhythmia, which you can see here, is defibrillated, and then sinus rhythm is restored. So in summary, for sudden cardiac arrest in handball, we can prevent with screening. For the cases that slip through, you need to recognize if a player goes down, they are displaying seizure activity or agonal breathing, this needs to be treated as a cardiac arrest until proved otherwise. Everybody on the court side needs to be prepared, physiotherapists, coaches, medics, everybody must be prepared in order to deliver early CPR and defibrillation. And it does work. This is Joachim Ernsten. He's a 32-year-old Swedish handball player. In May 2014, he had a syncopal event on the court, and this is him being carried off the pitch at that time. Only less than three months ago, he suffered a cardiac arrest during handball play. And you can see here that everybody's already aware, look, calling for help. He's gone down. The seriousness of the situation is recognized straight away. People go for help very quickly. And he has appropriate resuscitation on the court. Everybody's calm. Everybody knows exactly what they need to do. This is the player less than 17 minutes after he went down. He's been given life-saving defibrillation promptly. And you can see maybe just at the bottom here, on the monitor, sinus rhythm is restored. He's sitting up, he's able to talk. To all intents and purposes, he's back to normal. And less than 17 minutes later, he's transferred to hospital. And one week after this incident, he had an implantable defibrillator. And although he hasn't returned to play, he's now working as a coach in handball, and he's able to enjoy a happy life with his young family. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the athlete screening department, and also the organizers of this conference in allowing us to pre present a cardiac topic in a very musculoskeletal agenda. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carmen Victoria, for this, for this very nice and very entertaining and very informative talks. Okay. I'm sure from all the muscular speaking okay. crowds there were plenty of questions. Mats. So, please, the microphone. Uh, I have a little question about uh, the large consumptions of uh, COX inhibitors uh, and sports and cardiac arrest situations. I think the, the concern in um, the COX inhibitors is, is in triggering a problem in somebody who already has coronary artery disease. And for the younger players, we don't tend to see too much premature coronary artery disease. For us, we're aware that this is this is a common medication that's used in musculoskeletal conditions. I'm not aware that there's been a particular problem in athletes, certainly younger athletes. I think it's more a problem for the older populations where it's been used much more on a regular basis for chronic pain management, for example, arthritis, etc. But in the, the most likely causes of sudden cardiac arrest in athletes, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't have a problem, for example, in hyper, hypertrophy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in the iron channel, ion channel opathies, the COX-2 inhibitors will not interfere with that disease process. It's more in um, either unmasking or causing a problem in patients who already have coronary artery disease. And as I say, we t tend to see this in the older populations and in patients who are using these, using these medications on a long-term basis for chronic pain management rather than perhaps for pain control if they have an injury. Next question from Professor Steuer from Germany, please. Mrs. Uh, Adamus, Mrs. Bird, uh, as a German orthopedics, I understood your lecture. I, I want to say that it's uh, remarkable. Thank you very much. I'm the German team doctor who lost 2009 CB5 in Switzerland. And uh, I want to tell you that um, it is in my, op it is in my uh, 
thought it's necessary to repeat the, the message. You must investigate the sportsmen. It is not enough to think that they are investigated. You must be sure that they have all the, all the tests in the, in the past. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? I maybe have one at the end to close. Um, you, Victoria, you've shown the case at the end, the Swedish player that sort of miraculously survived, but we all have experience from our own hospital surgeons where the, the survival rate of, of all these CPRs that we have been applied, you know, in normal patients is not very high. What's, what's the likelihood of an athlete surviving a sudden cardiac death if appropriate help is actually applied? I think it's, you have to understand the underlying cause of the cardiac arrest. So if an elderly patient sustains a cardiac arrest, they often have ischemic heart disease and multiple comorbidities. Their brains are much more uh, vulnerable to hypoperfusion. And if they have any what we would call significant downtime when they have no meaningful cardiac output, they can sustain significant brain damage, they can sustain acute renal failure due to hypoperfusion of their kidneys. Everything is very finely balanced in, in a more elderly population, which is why the survival rate is so poor. And also when these patients arrest, they may not arrest into a cardiac rhythm that, that's, that we can defibrillate. If, for example, if they develop asystole, you cannot defibrillate asystole, you can only de defibrillate ventricular arrhythmias. In the younger population, the final common pathway of cardiac arrest is always a ventricular arrhythmia. So the videos that I showed, these two players, both had hypertrophy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they both died of ventricular arrhythmia. Arrhythmogenic card cardiomyopathy, again, patients arrest with ventricular arrhythmia. Iron channelopathies, patients arrest with ventricular arrhythmia. And ventricular arrhythmia is eminently treatable. You defibrillate somebody within a few minutes of it happening, and for sure you'll get them back, for sure. And also, the younger players, their organs are much more robust. They're not as vulnerable to the effects of hypoperfusion as the more elderly population. And so, in the, in, in, let's say you have a 50-year-old that collapses at home and they have 20 minutes of downtime before sinus rhythm is restored, they will often have significant cerebral injury. And even though you may restore their output, they could have very, very severe brain damage. But if an athlete goes down on a pitch, on a field of play, you can defibrillate them within minutes, they can be back to normal. Five minutes later, awake, talking, just as you saw in, in the last case, in, in Mr. Ernston. You know, he was sitting up, okay, I feel fine. He gets a defibrillator, perfect. Yes. There are some, some, some data that in these cases, up to 90% of the player who had a cardiac arrest, if they are appropriately managed, they can survive, 90%. Yeah, very high. So, so that's an encouraging message, and that's probably the right message to lead us to the coffee break. So I invite everybody to have a coffee and then be back here at, I think, 11.30 it is. Thank you very much.